Okay, and in this week's Financial Acumen episode, I'm thrilled to have our guest today, Emil Stefanuti, co-founder and CEO of ShopR TV, an ad tech startup focused on shoppable TV advertising for small businesses and direct-to-consumer brands of any size. With, 20, with over 20 years as an entrepreneur in tech, media, and design, Emil co-founded Contract Room, which was acquired by Mitra Tech in 2021. This award-winning legal tech company disrupted how contract negotiations and management are done in business. Previously, Emil co-founded Magazine's publication, acquired by Editorial Armonia and America Riches, and held executive positions at the NBA and VIX. He founded his first profitable startup at age 14. Emil is a highly successful entrepreneur who, despite starting with little financial background, managed to build a thriving business. Welcome to the show, Emil. I'm so thrilled to have you on, on the show. I think this is going to be fantastic. Yeah, thanks, Richards. I've been looking forward to uh, to doing this, and I look forward to the to the conversation. Absolutely. And I tell you, when I first met you several months ago, Emil, what was really, really impressive, and, and it took my mind to this uh, financial acumen series, is about how honest and vulnerable, vulnerable you were about your own financial journey, right? Um, yeah. As, you know... And the, and the podcast title is what I learned about managing business finances from a non-financial entrepreneur. And you are very honest about that journey. So thank you for that, Emil. Oh, absolutely. I mean, everybody who knows me knows, uh, you know, know, knows that um, I was, I was uh, academically speaking, I went to a design school, so it couldn't be farther away from, from, uh, from finance. And, um, you know, life just put me in a situation where I needed to learn quick and, and learn deep. So uh, here we are. Absolutely. So this is going to be great. So let's talk a little bit about your journey then, Emil. Your journey from being a non-financial entrepreneur to gaining a strong understanding of your business finances. So just tell us a little bit about that journey and then what motiv motivated you to take on this challenge? I mean, I, I, um, the, the journey was... Uh, you know, full of curves and surprises. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, every two or three years, I found myself doing something I, I never thought I would be doing. And, and that's still the case today. So um, it's never dull for me, has never been. Uh, and, you know, I think it's a combination of staying open-minded and being curious about things that could uh, potentially be interesting for, for someone like me. And then, you know, whenever... I, I latch onto an opportunity and just stick with it uh, until I see it through. Um, and in, in terms of motivations, I think that once you are on that boat, I don't think it really is a choice anymore, right? If you want to be a successful entrepreneur, at least. Particularly once you start raising funding from investors, right? And people who are trusting you and are giving you their money and are counting on you to make good decisions, you know, with, with, with regards to their money. So when an investor, whether institutional or a strategic partner or individuals, you know, friends, family, decide to invest in your company, they're taking a big risk. Uh, because statistically speaking, you know, most startups will fail. So this is a bet they're placing on you. Uh, so the one thing you know, that I always figure I could guarantee them I would always do is to manage those funds uh, carefully, responsibly, judiciously. Uh, I think that's the very minimum you need to do to seriously commit to when you are in that in that position. So to me, that meant making sure I, good, I, I got as good as I could and as quickly as I could um, in just learning some of the basics and then progressively sort of keep keep working hard to become as much of an expert as I could, at least on the things that really matter to me. Now, I have to disclose up front that, uh, you know, I was extremely lucky to get a great partner. Uh, yes. My partner, Peter Thompson, is a, an amazing partner, but also a very smart finance person. So, you know, everything that you'll hear from, from you know, in this conversation, I think you have to take to the filter of, of me, you know, being being somebody lucky enough to get a, a good partner that knew a lot more than I ever did. And I will probably ever will about finance. So, so Emil, take us through the <coughs> financial learning journey. 
All right. So you had a partner. Your partner was, uh, you know, really kind of good on the financial side. You had relied on him quite honestly. Now, just take us, you know, in the major kind of milestones and steps in your journey to learn about the business finances. Um, uh, it, to, to tell us, tell us your steps you took there and and how you grew. Sure. Uh, I mean, the thing that deeper dive for me was contract room uh, because it was the biggest business that required the biggest kind of uh, this, the largest amount of money and, and that had the, the largest potential ultimately. So, I mean, I started with, with uh, one of the most basic issues, right? Which is not having any money to start the business. Right. And, and how do you go about that? Uh, so that's kind of step one. And I'm sure it happens to many, many other entrepreneurs that they start, they have a great idea. And now where do we get the money, right, to do this? Um, so that is one aspect of finance that uh, was interesting for me and something I had to learn pretty quickly. I, we were lucky to get some family and friends and, and some of our own savings to fund the first you know, a few months of operations, but then we knew that we had to get bigger. So building a financial plan, building, you know, the whole logic around why somebody should give us money and why somebody should trust that, that what we were uh, dreaming of as a project was going to be successful ultimately was, you know, although it's, it's not really an Excel type of exercise alone, is very much an, a financial sort of exercise, right? At the end of the day, they're giving you money. They want to know how much, uh, what percentage of the company they're getting back for it and what protections they have. And you want to know what protections you have and and so on and so forth. So that was, that was a big thing. And I think there was really reading a ton of books for sure and blogs and listening to people and calling people that knew more than I did uh, I think you mentioned earlier on just kind of being honest about what you don't know, uh, being humble enough to to know that you just don't know, right? There is no pride in in going around claiming that you know something if you're not able to raise the money, right? So there's no shame, um, and 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 that was important, right? That and there is I don't know there are probably fifty to a hundred books on on fundraising that uh that i went through right and then podcasts and you know blogs and also all sorts of, of different things i think today uh, a lot of vcs uh, have a lot of great content uh that maybe didn't exist quite as much as as you know when we were first starting so now i think entrepreneurs in my position um back then have more alternatives that than I, than I used to to have then once you get the money if you're lucky and good enough then it's how to deploy that right so you need to have a plan you you don't get or we didn't get at least uh enough money to go crazy right and we and know that we would have gone crazy but but it's still you know you know that you have some money that has to last you as much as as, as long as you you can and that really ha can have to take you, it has to take you to the next sort of level, right? To the next uh, milestone so that you either are able to sustain your own operations with what you're generating in terms of revenue, or you're in a position to raise more, more funding if, if, if needed, right? Um, so that journey was kind of step two, right? So it's setting up all the systems, setting up all the processes, making decisions on how we're going to spend the money first uh and that essentially meant for us two big things right it was product and uh and marketing and sales right so how how many people do we need to build this product what kind of people do we need them what do we need and when do we need them so being able to sort of keep an eye on a combination of your product roadmap what, what are the things that you want to build and the timeline in which you want to build, you know, build these these features, which is usually also connected to promises you've made to potential clients, partners, and 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 the market, and opportunities that you've seen that you don't want others to kind of jump in front of. And uh, 
So you, you're looking at what you want to build and how fast you want to build it. You have some people already in your team and you're starting to really see some velocity, right? And being able to measure how fast can they deliver the things that they're working on. And that sort of starts giving you enough data to start saying, okay, so what's my capacity today? How much capacity do I need moving forward? And how long does it take to hire somebody and get them ready to really start becoming productive? So how much sooner do you need to start getting all these people on board? I mean, it, it's funny, right? So I went, like I said, I went to design school and I, and I after a, a few punches in the face, I think, of not really understanding things, I I figure out that the way I think, the way that things work for me is to um to design things, right? So that's something that became really natural. Uh, so I started designing finance and I started to design, you know, contracts. And I started to design things that way. So it's funny, you, you you still have all my notebooks from, you know, early days and I have actual sketches of Excel spreadsheets, right? So it's, it's not the usual thing that you would expect a CEO to be doing, but that's what worked for me. So I think one of the important things I learned is that you just need to find something that works for you. It doesn't have to be the same thing that would work for everybody else, but it has to work for you uh, in a predictable way, in an efficient way, and so on. So my partner was very patient with me and and he let me run my way, even though it wasn't his way, right? And we we ended up being very good uh, together at getting things done. So raise money, plan ahead, really learn how much money you're going to need. Then you get into step three, which is sales, right? And that's trying to predict how much money you're going to be making and uh, correlating that how much, how fast you're going to be spending, right? So you want to be aggressive because you want to conquer the world. But you also got to be careful because you don't want to run out of money too soon. So, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges was, you know, we have the tendency to be very optimistic, right, about everything, about both the, how much money we're going to be making and also uh, how little money we're going to be spending, right? And, and and it actually, you know, when you look at it, when I look at when I look back and see it in perspective, I think it's actually a little bit the opposite, right? You're going to end up spending more than you anticipated. Things will take a little longer than you thought or hoped for. And um, and you're going to see a lot of, you know, you're going to have a lot of surprises in, in the way. Granted, some of those surprises can be good, but often when it comes to finance, they're not, especially the first year, right? So it's, uh, it's not always good surprises. So that was very challenging uh, for me at the beginning. It's like, I don't have any historical data. We haven't been, you know, operating for many years. So it's not like, it's not easy for me to say, uh, hey, you know, we, you know, we, we, we predict that we're going to be kind of like the last 10 years. In here, we say, well, I don't know. I mean, we, we had some conversations that they seem to want to buy what we have, but we, we don't know. And, and we were selling to lawyers in big corporations, right? So uh, sales cycles are very slow and decision-making takes a long time. Um, and it becomes really uh, scary sometimes because you, you see, you know, the company spending money and, and you don't really know when those checks are going to start coming in. Uh, and there's some very dark days in which you, you don't seem to uh, to to see where you know how things are gonna end up happening, right? So there were very very scary nights where you know we were really running on fumes, and payroll was coming up, and we had responsibilities that we didn't want to uh, miss. And so yeah, that 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 was a a, a very big uh, thing, and then. You know, fast forward to getting money and sort of starting to generate revenue and hiring a bigger team. And now you're spending more money, but you're also making more money. And now you have to be making bigger decisions. Like, for instance, where are you going to grow? Right. So we 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 started a company here in Miami. Uh, back then, it was hard to grow it here. Um, I think the, the the culture of entrepreneurship and you know, VC money and whatever it wasn't really yet where it is today. So we we ended 
you know, having to pack our bags and move west to 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 Silicon Valley. Uh, it's sort of, you know, I think we 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 believe that you could fail anywhere, but at that time, for the kind of business we were doing, if you were going to make it, chances were that you were going to make it there. Uh, so yeah. we we you know we packed our bags and did what we had to do. But then, obviously, grow you know moving out of headquarters to California was one thing. Growing the company to tens uh, and 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 maybe hundreds of people later on uh, in the Bay Area was going to be very prohibitive, right? So we had to also be smart in saying, you know, you know, if you hired a junior developer in California, you're going to be spending almost two hundred thousand dollars right off the bat. So what's the best we can do? Uh, so we ended up having a team in Poland. We had a team. We ended up building a big team in in Mexico. Um, so we 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 were resourceful in trying to find not only places that were cheap because that that's never enough in my opinion, but places where we could find highly motivated people that were looking for opportunities to jump on a startup and really give it give it their their best, and places where we had enough sort of financial um, resources to be generous and to be, you know, to be able to treat people the way we wanted to treat them without having to raise millions and millions of dollars to do those things, right? So we never went crazy, but we had to get resourceful in, in making sure that we could grow in the right in the right places. Then, of course, you have to, you start signing customers and closing deals and now you have to keep those customers happy right and now you have to renew those deals later on because we're in software as a service so it's kind of a subscription based so in, in that world then you have to learn a bunch of things again um that require from the financial perspective a lot of new metrics a lot of new concepts a lot of new sort of things to understand and to really control uh, more, you know, board members and, you know, the bigger, <laughs> bigger it gets, the more complicated it, it gets. Um, and that has its own set of challenges. And and finally, of course, whenever somebody makes an offer and says, hey, we want to buy you or we want to acquire your company, then there's a whole new set of things to learn, you know, valuation and and legally speaking, there's just a, a ton of things, you know, uh, due diligence and, uh, making sure that at that point you had hopefully all all the right decisions made early early on on your finance and how you're keeping track of your data and, and your records so that when that day comes, hopefully you are not disqualified just because you didn't have your stuff together, you know? So, so that's a long-winded sort of answer, but for a very long and winded uh, road to get to where I am today. No, that's that's awesome. I love the way you broke it out in terms of the various um, life cycles of the business. So that's and you you perfectly frame the conversation. So now let's go a few levels deep. So in terms of the first phase of from a financial standpoint, Emil, the capital raise. What would you say was your biggest learning in terms of the capital raise from a financial standpoint? So I would say that. Uh... I wasn't expecting so much rejection. Uh, and, and I think I had been a lucky, lucky person in life. But, you know, uh, there is so many no's in order to get a yes, right? And, and you know, one good thing about being in the Bay Area uh, in Silicon Valley was that that's the common story for everybody, right? So, and it was funny. I, I found... I found it to be an interesting journey there at the beginning because I, I was surprised on how often people will give you the time of day to sit down with you and listen to your story and listen to what you were building. And I said, you know, is it is it because Californians are nicer people? I said, uh, maybe, but that 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 doesn't seem just <laughs> you know good enough answer, <laughs> right? And then and then I started thinking about it. I said, you know, I think nobody in Silicon Valley wants to be the guy that said no to Steve Jobs or to Zuckerberg or to Musk or to, you know, the Google guy. So in that sense, that was interesting, right? You, you, you learned that everybody, even the biggest names out there 
face a ton of rejection early on. So that sort of gives you a little bit of, of hope, you know, as you go. So I, I think really being able to balance uh from the financial perspective the optimist the optimism of how much money you're gonna you know sell how much are you gonna sell uh and then you know being really able to you know to to execute on that later on it's a tough balance right so all VCs want to hear these big numbers, right? And back in the day, everybody just, they just wanted to invest. And still today, they just wanted to invest on unicorns, right? They want to have companies that are going to make, a, a that are going to be worth a billion dollars or more. And that makes total sense to them. You know, I, I was on the other hand think, thinking, well, you know, if my business ended up being worth only 500 million, I would be cool with that, you know? It does have, for me, it's a different journey. So that that was a tough balancing act at the beginning is how much should you be stretching reality, right? To please uh, investors, uh, knowing that if they choose to invest, now they're going to hold you to, to what you, whatever you said, right? And, and I saw, it didn't happen to us as badly, but I saw many people and it started to, ha- it's, it's, you, I think it's happening a lot today with people that during the good old days in the 2021 20, and 22, where, you know, raising money became really easy. They had these huge rounds at huge valuations. And now I think they're going to have to face the music, right? Um, the market wasn't there. And now, you know, it, it's, it's a tough thing. So for me, that was a bit even counterintuitive. Uh, I didn't want to BS people so much, right? I didn't want to be saying, oh, yeah, next year, I'm just going to grow a thousand percent. I'm gonna, We're going to be closing, you know. 10 times as many deals because I couldn't see where and how, you know, we were in an industry that was just starting to grow. So there weren't enough clients to satisfy that kind of promise. Um, so that was an important thing for us to sort of master. What's the right balance between the optimism that some investor require and the realism of what you actually do believe that can be done even with their money, right? And how fast that 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 journey we you know can can actually go. So that was one thing. I think you know projecting and having all the the models and everything built uh, you know I, like I said I was extremely lucky Peter was a weezer with all this stuff. So I I, I personally, you know, don't want to take almost any credit. I think we we the way we worked is we would sit down, he would show me, you know, we would talk about the the basics. What do we think we can do? You know, what would it take to get us there? You know, how much do we think we need to spend? Is it the right way of spending? Are we are we sure this is kind of what, what we want to commit to? And then sort of he would go and paint that picture in numbers in, in a way that could be uh, communicated properly to to the right people. So uh that was very good and i always joked and said you know we early on peter and i sort of split responsibilities in a way that made sense from our personalities and the things that we believe we were really good at and the things that we we definitely were not good at and uh and also what the company needed for for us to do early days when you're just take wearing so many hats right so uh at the end of the day i said listen you know i'll make sure that we have trains and you'll make sure that they run on time right and then together we'll figure out you know how to make sure that all the seats in those trains are filled and that people are happy to ride on on our train but that was kind of the thing right so i was thinking on product and sort of innovation and how do we sell this how do we implement this and he was really on how do we make sure that we have oxygen to do all the things that we need to do, HR and legal and, you know, and, and all those things that he was amazing at. And I could have, you know, I just wouldn't know how, where even to, to start. So um, that, that was interesting. Then of course you start getting people interested 
and a different kind of dance starts, you know, you have to get pretty good at presenting your business and sounding convincing and, you know, showing your passion for what you're doing, which if you're really passionate about what you're doing, it's not that hard because it just, it, it actually becomes harder uh, to, to contain rather than hard to, you know, showcase. Yeah. Um, so that, that I think was, was something that we, we were okay at. And then obviously, you know, you get worried about not getting uh, a lot of yeses when you're talking to people, right? And people taking forever and and you hear so many opinions from so many people, right? So it can be overwhelming and, and a lot of these opinions are going to contradict each other, right? So you trust two people, they're both telling you with a lot of passion and, and conviction that this is what you need to do and they contradict each other and you are kind of in the middle saying, okay, so which which is it? Which way do we go? So all of that, it's an interesting journey. I, and I think end of day, you just trust your gut uh, and try to to fill your gut or that gut with with as much data as you can, right? So, and that's again where you have to be good at understanding what are the right metrics, what are what are the things that will really matter to you, and, and the things that you know you can think about later, but not not right now. Right now, you've hit some some great points. You've hit some great points. So. So, Emil, what specific financial challenges did you face when you first started your business and how did you overcome them? Uh, well, like I said, I think number one, uh, raising money. I already spoke uh, a lot about that and learning all the different pieces of that. Are you doing convertible notes? Are you doing saves? Are you doing this or that? And what what, what are those things and how do they work and so on? Then... A lot of the mechanics of running a software as a service business where it was challenging. Uh, you know, uh, SaaS is interesting because you, you know, once you get that machine sort of going on the revenue side, then it gets exponentially larger, right? Especially if you're doing, you know, things the, the right way. But at the beginning, it's very slow. Right. So because you're not just getting a big paycheck up front, you're just sort of collecting uh, sort of subscription revenue month by month. And that ends up piling up. But, it, you know, that that beginning, it's it's uh, it's tough. So that, that that was a big challenge. Right. I think revenue recognition was very tricky for me. Right. Because, again, when you are in a SaaS business and I think right when we were starting to generate some revenue, there were some new revenue recognition laws that had changed. Yeah. And we had to really understand how how to do the numbers. Uh, it was tricky, right? You have yearly contracts made, sometimes multi-year contracts. And there are many of them are paid in advance, but you can also only recognize that money on a monthly basis. Um, so <laughs> that, that I think... Uh, you know, made it complicated there for for a little for a little while, and and again, I was glad that Peter was the one handling that. Um, you know, and the way I learned about finance at that point is really the way I had to learn about almost everything else, right? Like engineering and sales and legal and HR. Um, so Peter was my first source of information. You know, I would just go to him over and over and over again. Um, so I can't stress enough for any entrepreneur listening to this of how important it is to, to work with the right partner and with the right people around you. Uh, I think th many people, even myself in, in previous companies, I had the uh, sort of tendency to want to partner with a friend. Uh, and then I learned the hard way sometimes that that's not always the case. Right. So I, with, with Peter, we weren't. We, we met very, very um, uh, early on on the, on the process, but we weren't friends before we started the company. And, and I consider now uh, Peter to be a great friend, but we became friends after we worked together and after we were partners, not the other way around. And, and, and so I think that actually helped a little bit. And I think many people get in trouble because they do it the other way around. 
um, I, I, you know, to each his own, but that I think is a tricky thing, right? It, it's, it, and it's risky because, you know, at that point you're not only risking your, your business, you're also risking your friendship and that different story for another day, but that's, um, that's a tough one. Um, so, you know, we find this again, uh, I think being paranoid for me was kind of a good thing that a healthy dose of paranoia, uh, worked for me, right. Because that gives you a sense of urgency to make sure that everything is where it needs to be, that you're not making stupid mistakes and you're not understanding even that you're making, um, so that that again was was very important to us, right? We we sort of agreed on the fact that this was very crucial that we were not cutting corners, that we were not, you know, um, doing stupid things that would be very expensive later on. Yep. And uh, it's not just that 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 that's you know what keeps the lights on and people happy, but it's just, you know, your fiduciary duty with your investors, right? And we have close friends that invested here and that that raised the bar quite a bit. Got it, got it. Okay, all right. So were there any particular financial concepts or principles, Emil, that you found particularly challenging to grasp and how did you go about learning them? Uh, I mean, I think progressively there were always things here and there. I think other than revenue recognition, which threw me out for a spin for a, for a little while there. I, I think other than that, the, there wasn't anything that, that was super complex. I, I think we, especially at the beginning, you don't have any money. So in that sense, life is relatively simple, right? Taxes are simple because you, you don't have anything, mm -hmm. you know, to pay taxes on. Uh, you know, you don't have a lot of people, therefore you don't have a lot of payroll issues or people issues. And so, you know, I, I think um, I would say again, is, is how to know how much money you're going to have and you're going to need at any given point, in, you know, in, in, in your journey, it's always the hardest thing for me, right? It's, it's, you can plan everything, and you can, I mean, we, we were in the middle of the, in our business when COVID hit, right? So like, how do you prepare for that? How do you react to that? How do you know, or what do you do in advance to, do you, you know, to sort of prepare for that? And that's almost impossible, right? Um, so I think that was always very tricky. Like, like the, the whole point of saying, okay, if we need to have a million dollars in October, right and we are in may uh and we have seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars now you know and uh it takes six months to close a new account from the moment we you know we first start the, the discussions with a potential customer to the moment that we start implementing and charging them you know how do you make sure that you have enough pipeline, right? Because then you start dealing with all the metrics that have to do with sales and sales optimization, where you say, well, in, in roughly you say, hey, one of each 10 prospects actually buy. So if, if the $250,000 of new revenue that you need to generate, uh, it's equivalent to, let's say, two or three accounts, then you need you know, roughly 30 prospects six months in advance if that's what you know how long it usually takes to close a deal and 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 then that math and making sure that all those things are really happening it's very very tricky or it was for me right i think at, after a while you start sort of you become good at reading the some of the situations and being able to say these guys really are really serious right now. These other guys really are, are not, and there are more tools now to sort of track that. So we we use what we call what's called BANT, which is you know stands for budget, authority, timing, and need. So and with that, you would be able to say, okay, so are we talking to the right person? Do they have the money to buy a product like ours? Do they actually need a product like ours? You know, are they actually planning on buying a product like ours in, in, in the next year, 
or are they just kind of thinking about it for three years uh, down the road? So all of that gave us a little bit of a sense of whether it was realistic to think that we could generate that money on time to sort of use it for the things that we were planning on spending that money on, right? So at some point it becomes hard because you say, well, you know, we have it in the budget, but we haven't generated it yet. So do we spend it? Do we get the commitment that's going to get us to the point that now we have to sign a check for money that we are not entirely sure that we that, that it's coming? So those those days for me, Richard, were always a little tricky. I, I, I'm I not the kind of guy that is okay with hiring a bunch of people and then three months later firing them because you you you, you, didn't, you weren't able to execute the way you were thinking, right? So that was always, for me, a big concern. Like, I, I don't want to get us in trouble and I don't want to be asking people to leave their jobs to join us and then just a few weeks later say, oops, you know, we weren't able to close that deal that we thought we weren't going to close. Now you have to go home. So personal those were things that I believe are very challenging. Yeah. Yeah. You took personal responsibility and accountability. So um, I want to go back because you said you read a lot and you had a lot of resources and you read a lot of books. Um, would you point to any particular resources or tools particular that stood out for you that helped you on your financial journey? Yeah. I mean, uh, I have to say, I, I, yeah, I think thanks to my my parents, I I, I read it a lot, right, and maybe two or three books a month, and I I try to keep that rhythm, right, and so if you consider that we were the the whole journey with this company took twelve years, uh, that gives you what roughly three hundred books, <laughs> so there is a lot there, and I'm I'm not gonna go into everything. But uh, I mean, there were some that really became essential for me at some points in the journey, right? And I can think of, you know, some of the classics that that you know everybody sort of reads, uh, you know, Good to Great and Built to Last and all these, you know, big ones, right? I think beyond though, beyond those, I think uh, Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore was very important to me, and that's very specific about you know the kind of business that we were in. Zero to One, I think, was a great book. Yes. It's uh, by Peter Thiel. I think that's a right. very good uh, book yep. to, yeah, to understand the journey. Uh, Bleed Scaling became a big uh, help for me by, by Reid Hoffman. We were trying to go from startup to, to grow up. Um, you know, I think there's a great book by Ben Horowitz uh, that's called What You Do Is Who You Are. Uh, and, and that was tremendously helpful. I mean, uh, because I think even though these are not, not necessarily strictly about finance, uh, they are all somewhat related to the way you should be thinking about your business and therefore finance, right? So uh, I think it was a book by by the, the founders of Basecamp that I think it was called Rework. And that was really helpful at, at some point where, where I was trying to do too much and and sort of learn that wait there are certain things that maybe it's it's better that you don't need to do right now. Uh, and back in the day, I think there were two very interesting books that helped. Uh, one is the Lean Startup, which became yep. kind of a, a big thing by I think Eric Grice. Uh, I think it's been overused and misunderstood by people that sort of read some pages. It seems and they think that you know uh, being uh, agile and 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 sort of having this MVP is equivalent of just irresponsibly doing things without thinking them through. Uh, so I think there is a bit of confusion around around that. And and I think another one that I would recommend anybody who's getting into SaaS and and trying to sell software, uh, it's uh, Predictable Revenue by Aaron Ross. Mm -hmm. um and and i think for me anything by peter drucker is worth reading if you're if you are an entrepreneur if you're trying to um to get good at, at, at things so again not exclusively about finance uh but a lot about culture and about how to think about the things you need to do and how to sell obviously i mean if you if you don't sell then there's no money right there's no finance for you to do 
if you don't learn how to build a team, then you're not spending all that much, right? So, so at the end of the day, for me, it was really about how we do everything, uh, including finance. I think there's some podcasts and some blogs that I used to follow. Some of them, there's plenty of them uh, about fundraising or about hiring or about be, being a CEO, being uh, master uh, master of scale. Uh, Reed Hoffman, I think, is, is very good. Uh, so, you know, and then, like I said, a lot of VCs now have great, great content for entrepreneurs. I think Andreessen Horowitz, uh, they have great stuff. And um, first round, I think they were some of the first, uh, you know, VCs that, that really hired great people to generate useful content for entrepreneurs. And from there on, I think uh, there's probably 15 or 20 that I read very often.